very well-known Rashi at the beginning of Parshas Vayetze says, why does the Pasuk say, Vayetze Yaakov mi Be'er Sheva Ve'ela Haran? Now, why does the Pasuk say that Yaakov left Be'er Sheva and went to Haran? Why didn't it just say, Ve'ela Haran, that Yaakov went to Haran? We knew where he was coming from. So Rashi says, why did it mention, Vayetze Yaakov mi Be'er Sheva? Elamagid she yitzia tzadik men amakom osa roshem. To teach us, or to note the fact that when a tzaddik leaves a place, it makes an impression. Shebizman shah tzaddik ba'ir, when the tzaddik is in the city, hu hoda, he is its glory, hu ziva, he is its radiance, hu hadara, he is its splendor. Yatsam isham, when he left the city, pana hoda, pana ziva, pana hadara. Its glory departs, its radiance departs, its splendor departs. Mori Virabi Rav Lichtenstein, Zechor Tzadik Tivracha Harini Kaparas Mishkavo, departed from us on Rosh Chodesh Iyar, the month that is known also as Chodesh Ziv. Chodesh Ziv, the month of radiance, a month whose radiance has departed from the world today. And as uh, Mrs. Abrams already mentioned, I'm not sure the degree to which uh, those of you sitting here today feel the loss of Rav Lichtenstein. Most of you probably never had a personal interaction with him, but I can certainly testify that for those of us who had the zechus of being in his presence and of being his Talmidim, the sense that we woke up with yesterday morning, not just that somebody was missing, but that the world is a different place a feeling that is very palpable for all of us. <coughs> Rav Luchenstein once gave a sicha at Shalash on the topic of teaching Torah to your own children. He made sure to pick a Shabbos when his family wasn't there so he wouldn't make them uncomfortable. And he told the story, he said, when I was eight years old, I remember sitting on my father's lap in the dining room and finishing learning with him Parshas Truma. And I remember that he went into the kitchen and he said to my mother, I know what they do in Gan Eden. They sit with their boy on their lap and learn Torah. Or Lichtenstein now, although he's left us bereft, now sitting in Gan Eden, once again with his father, and I'm sure appreciating the simcha of Olam Haba, together with him, as we are Abel, as we mourn here. I'm going to share with you a couple of very brief pieces of Torah from Rav Lichtenstein, uh, as I was asked to do and use them as a means of trying to draw a little bit of a picture of certain aspects of his greatness. In the amount of time that we have, I can't really scratch the surface, um, but I'm going to focus on a couple of things that are particularly important, at least to me. Speaking very personally, there's a great poignancy in particular to Rav Lichtenstein's passing as I mentioned, Rav Lichtenstein was nifter on Aleph Iyar. Aleph Iyar on a Monday. Happens to be that the very first day that I had the zechus of sitting in Rav Lichtenstein's shir was on Monday, Aleph Iyar, 24 years ago, in 1991. And I want to share with you a couple of things that we learned in shir that day. We were learning Masechus Brachos, and we were considering a statement in the Gemara, Mishnah, excuse me, on Daftes, which says, excuse me, on, yes, on Daftes on the days, <coughs> what happens if a person misses Man Kriyashma in the morning? You're supposed to say Kriyashma before the end of the third hour of the day. And the Mishnah says, well, if Zman Kriyashma passed, should you say Kriyashma or should you not say Kriyashma? The Zman has passed. 
You're not going to be Yotze the Mitzvah anymore if you say it now. But the Mishnah concludes by saying, Hakore Mikan Ve'elach, somebody who reads the Shema later than the proper time, Lo Hifsid Ka'adam Hakore Batorah. Person hasn't lost anything, not a total loss, just like someone who's reading from the Torah. Kriya Shema is part of the Torah, so if you read the Shema, you've learned some Torah. Rashi explains, a daf later, Shaharehu ka'adam ha'shekore achas mikol ha'parshi o'sher b'torah It's like someone who's reading some other parsha from the Torah. Va'afal pi shalo yatsi de kriya shma yesh lo kibul schar kosik b'torah Even though he didn't fulfill the mitzvah of kriya shma, he gets schar like anybody else who learns Torah. Rav Lichtenstein posed the very obvious question. Isn't that rather obvious? Of course a person who reads the Shema is fulfilling the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. A person who reads the parsha that comes before it is also fulfilling the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. A person who reads this Mishnah is also fulfilling the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. What point is there in mentioning, even if the person had read Shema at the proper time, if the person read it again three hours later, they fulfill the mitzvah of Talmud Torah, obviously. There has to be some meaning to this Mishnah. So Rav Lichtenstein, drawing on an idea that had uh, come out of certain other sources in the, in the discussion, said that what this Mishnah reflects is the fact that there apparently is a secondary element in the mitzvah of Kriya Shema. That while the basic mitzvah of Shema is to read that parsha as a means towards Kabbalah Salmach Shamayim, as a means towards recognizing the basic belief in the Ribbonu Shalolam and our acceptance of the old Malchus that he, the Borei Olam, created us and that we are here to be Ovde Hashem. That sense of Kabbalah Salmachus Shamayim, of accepting that fact, is the motivation and the principal element of Kriyashma. But, apparently, there's another element in the mitzvah of Kriyashma, an element of Talmud Torah. Such that when the mitzvah, when the, excuse me, when the Mishnah says, if you read the Shema when it's after the Zman, when it's after the proper time, that at least you're like someone learning Torah, it doesn't just mean that you're fulfilling the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. It means that you're somehow fulfilling one aspect of the mitzvah of Kriya Shema. And if you had read some, this Mishnah or read some other thing, you wouldn't have, be, you wouldn't have fulfilled this notion. What's the sense of the combination of Talmud Torah with Kriya Shema? Why bother having Kriya Shema include an aspect of learning Torah in it? Rav Lichtenstein didn't elaborate, but I think the answer is rather straightforward. Imagine for a moment if the mitzvah of Shema, instead of being the mitzvah to say Shema, was the mitzvah of Kabbalah Salmachus Shamayim. There was a mitzvah, the Torah said, every day, accept the yoke of heaven. How would we then accomplish this mitzvah? We get up every morning and we would say, I don't know, Hareini mekabel alai o malchus shamayim. I hereby accept upon myself the yoke of heaven. Would that mitzvah, would that ritual, would that experience have the same depth, the same meaning, the same gravitas, the same uh, transcendence as getting up every morning and saying, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad? Using the Devar Hashem itself, taking the opportunity to echo words that the Ribbon Shalom himself spoke to us as part of his charge to us to be his Ovdim, to be his Avadim, to use those words and all the, as I said, all the echoes that come along with it as the means of declaring our Kabbalah Samalchus Shamayim. That's a Kriya Shema, that's a Kabbalah Samalchus Shamayim that's altogether different. And so the, there is an element in Kriya Shema, the element of Talmud Torah, which takes the basic notion of Kabbalah Salmachus Shamayim and adds to it greater meaning, greater breadth, and greater depth. Which leaves us, though, still with a question. Well, if that's the case, that what we're talking about here is an additional element of the mitzvah of Kriya Shema, then why can I fulfill that part after the Zman? 
Mishnah said, the Zman Kriya Shema is until th the third hour of the morning. After that, I don't fulfill the Shema. But according to Rav Lichtenstein's reading, I do fulfill one aspect of the Shema. Well, why does that aspect get to survive after the third hour when the rest of it doesn't? So to understand that point, we need to understand something very basic about Shema, and something very basic about Kabbalah's Al Malchus Shemayim, and something that will help us to, uh, to draw a little bit of the character of Rav Lichtenstein, Zecher Tzadik Bivracha. We've already mentioned the fact that Kriya Shema, the Zman, the time to say Kriya Shema is for the first three hours of the day. There's also a mitzvah to say Kriya Shema at night. What's the Zman of Kriya Shema at night? When can you say Kriya Shema during the night? So the lacha is that you can say Kriya Shema the whole night. There might be l'chad chilas to say it earlier, but basically the Zman of Kriya Shema is the whole night. If you forgot to say Kriya Shema and you woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning and it's still dark outside, so you can say Kriya Shema then. Why is there a difference between the Kriya Shema Shel Arvis and the Kriya Shema Shel Shachris? Why is it that the Zman of Kriya Shema at night is the whole night? And the Zman of Kriya Shema during the day is only at the beginning of the day. So, much of what I'm talking about here tonight is uh, our sugyas about which there's a lot to say. Obviously, I'm, I'm cherry picking a couple of different ideas. But the simplest explanation, to my mind, of the difference between Kriya Shema Shel Arvis and Kriya Shema Shel Shachris, Kriya Shema of the night and Kriya Shema of the day, is that it reflects a very basic difference between the night and the day. Generally speaking, certainly in uh, earlier generations, and even to some degree today, to a great degree today, the nighttime is a rather homogeneous period of time in terms of the human experience. Right? Most of the night we spend sleeping. The part of the night that we're not spending sleeping, we're generally not resting, hanging out, I know you're in college, so that's probably not true right now, but for most of your life, that's true, right? Um, the night is a kind of slow time, right? The daytime, the daytime is when we do everything, right? All of our life's activities in all their various forms, all the different kinds of things we do, all happen during the day. There's a mitzvah of Kabbalah from Malchus Shamayim to declare, to declare, I believe in Hashem, and I believe that the, the purpose and the contours of my life are to live this life in his service. That's Kabbalah so Malchus Shamayim. During the night, I can make that declaration at any point during the night, and it can succeed in defining my night for me. The middle of the night, the beginning of the night, the end of the night, they're all, it's all kind of the same. <coughs> but if I make that declaration during the day at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, then what does that mean about all the stuff that I did before that? I went through my day, I lived my life, I went to work, I ate my meals, I spoke to my colleagues and friends, I did all the different things, I went shopping, I did all the different things that I do in life. And I didn't say, I didn't define my day as one which is on the foundation of Kabbalah Salmach Shamayim. If I wake up at three in the afternoon and I say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, all right, but it hasn't defined my life. And that's why Kriya Shema during the day has to be in the morning. B'shach b'cha v'kumecha, b'kumecha, when you wake up in the morning, you make that declaration, and I say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, and that sets the stage and the tone and the direction for everything that I choose to do during the course of the day and establishes, on a, on a, establishes it on a foundation of meaning and avodas Hashem. So that's why Kabbalah so Malchus Shamayim, that's why there's this man Kriya Shema during the day. So let's return now to the more subtle point that I think is what Rav Lichtenstein was saying before. Rav Lichtenstein was saying that there's two aspects to Kriya Shema. There's the basic Kabbalah so Malchus Shamayim, and then there's the Talmud Torah. The Talmud Torah, which can take that Kabbalah so Malchus Shamayim and expand its horizons, make it deeper, make it more meaningful. That, perhaps, if you say it after the Zman, 
Lo hifsid kadam akari batara. To take your kabbal so machus shamayim and make it better, make it deeper, make it more meaningful, make it broader. That's something that you can keep doing over the course of the day. In fact, Adarava, what a wonderful thing to do, to during the course of one's day keep doing things, keep saying things that will enrich one's sense of Omal Malchus Shamayim. So that secondary aspect of Kabbalah so Malchus Shamayim, maybe that can happen for the rest of the day. But the basic fundamental foundation of Kabbalah so Malchus Shamayim, that's not Talmud Torah. That is something which is very, very simple. Jews who know almost nothing else, many of them know, Shema Yisrael Hashem Malokeinu Hashem Echad. You don't need Talmud Torah, you don't need great sophistication to simply believe and declare that my life is devoted to the belief in and service of Hashem. That has to be in the morning, and if you don't have it, then everything else has no, has no foundation. That Kabbal Salmach Shamayim can't be a work in progress during the course of the day. It has to be firm, it has to be absolute, it has to be whole. The simple and basic belief and charge and definition of my life and its activities. This distinction between the Talmud Torah of Kabbalah Salmachus Shamayim and the simplicity of the underlying Kabbalah Salmachus Shamayim captures, in an important sense, one of the great paradoxes of Rav Aaron Lichtenstein's Eicher Tzadik Levracha. Rav Lichtenstein, I don't know to what degree uh, those of you who didn't know him have been reading about him or hearing about him during the course of the, the last couple of days or, or prior to that. But Rav Lichtenstein, the intellectual giant, the analytical genius, the person who was known more than any of, uh, any of the uh, gedolim of our generation, who was known for the sophistication and the complexity of his response to difficult questions, was at the same time, for any, as anyone who encountered him knew, the simplest of a mamin ben maminim, a person who lived his life kulo, kulo, devoted to Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad to Anavodas Hashem that was not based on some complex philosophical argument, but that was something that was the basics, the, excuse me, the basic foundation of his personality. There's a uh, maybe some of you have seen this brief article, but there was a, a bit of a stir several, uh, a couple of decades ago um, when Rav Lichtenstein participated, I think it was a symposium of some sort, a couple of people were asked to write about Emuna. And I think it was actually in Emuna magazine, if I'm not mistaken. And Rav Lichtenstein was one of the people who was asked to write about him about faith. And everybody assumed I'm sure the people who asked him to write assumed, and certainly everybody who picked up the magazine assumed that when they read the Rav Lichtenstein's piece, this was going to be a deep philosophical treatise about faith. This is, of course, Rav Lichtenstein, the son-in-law of the, of the Rav Zatzal, the author of The Lonely Man of Faith. Everybody was expecting some great complex work. Then you opened up the article, and what did it say? What was the foundation of, what did he say with this foundation of his faith, of his Amuna? He said... It was a Talmud of Rav Hutner. And uh, how could you look at that face and be around him and not have a Muna? It was a Talmud of Rav Aaron Soloveitchik. How could you walk around Rav Aaron Soloveitchik and not have faith and not have a Muna? That was the real yesod, the real foundation of the person that Rav Lichtenstein was. You know, Yeshivat HaRetziel in the Gush is known because of, obviously because of Rav Lichtenstein's Derech uh, Halimud and Persona, as uh, as a place of uh, defined to some degree by intellectualism. I remember very well my first uh, during my first few weeks in the yeshiva during Elul, when 
um, we came in uh, Slichos night, the first night of Slichos on Motzei Shabbos. And so a lot of Talmidim, many Talmidim came into the base Medrash, you know, well before the Slichos were to begin, well before Chatzos, to learn something in preparation for the Yomim no Raim. And it was, it was interesting, I was looking around to see what different people were learning. What Sfarim did they pull out to prepare themselves for the Yom Adin? And so there were some people who had uh, Al Hachuva of the Rav, and uh, there were some people who were just learning Gemara, and there I think there were some real philosophers who had, I don't know, Amor Nevuchim or something out. And then Rav Lichtenstein came into the base Medrash. Rav Lichtenstein never walked, Rav Lichtenstein always ran. He came into the base Medrash and he zipped up the aisle, didn't look left or right, sat down at his seat and pulled out a little battered and tattered Mesilas Yesharim and sat there davening up his Mesilas Yesharim for the hour before the beginning of Slichos. Rav Lichtenstein wasn't looking for highfalutin philosophy to prepare to stand before the Ribbon Shalom on the Yom Hadin. Rav Lichtenstein, to that, in that sense, at his foundation, had a certain pashtos. It's almost, that's why I said this is a paradox. To use the word pashtos about Rav Lichtenstein seems very incongruous. But it is nevertheless true. This was reflected as well in the way he treated his rabbeim. I never had the zechus to see Rav Luchensin with, with the Rav. The truth is, I think the kind of position that you're in with regard to Rav Luchensin at your age is about the position that I was in with the Rav a generation ago. I was 20 years old when the Rav was Nifter and had grown up surrounded by his Talmidim as my, as my Rebbeim. But there were two people that Rav Luchensin called Mori Varabi. He didn't call the Rav Mori Varabi, he just called him the Rav. But one of them, I already mentioned them. He always used to say, Mori Varabi Rav Hutner Zal, Rav Hutner, with whom he learned in Chaim Berlin before he came to YU. And Mori Varabi Rav Aaron Salvechik. Rav Aaron Salvechik, the Rav's brother, with whom, if I'm not mistaken, Rav Luchensin also learned in Chaim Berlin before both of them came to YU. After I had learned in Haratzion, and I was back learning at YU, Rav Aaron Salavechik Zatzal was still alive. I'm not sure if any of you ever had the zechus or the opportunity to see Rav Aaron Salavechik. Unlike the Rav and Rav Lichtenstein, for that matter, who were very tall and imposing men, Rav Aaron Salavechik was, was a small man. And Rav Aaron Salavechik had, had had a stroke at a somewhat young age and, uh, and was very frail at the, at the time. He still traveled every week from Chicago to New York to, to give shiurim here at YU. And every single time that Rav Lichtenstein came to New York, he came to the base medrash at YU, uptown, and he would come to see Rav Aaron, the person he called Rav Aaron, Rav Aaron Salvechik. And whenever, on the occasions, a couple of times a year, when Rav Lichtenstein would walk into the base medrash at YU, obviously it would be a bit of a stir, and everybody would, uh, would look up. And when Rav Lichtenstein would come to the base medrash, he would, the first thing he would do would make a, a beeline for Rav Aaron Salavechik, who was sitting there in one of the front tables, a small man, very frail, bent over in his seat from the, the effects of his, of his condition. And I think he had Parkinson's disease also. Um, actually, maybe he just had Parkinson's disease. Now that I think about it, I apologize if I made a mistake. And Rav Lichtenstein, who was this you know, well over six feet large man, would sit down at the, in the, at the table next to Rav Aaron Salavechik and lean all the way over. And I tell you, the look on his face, it was like the look of a, of a teenager meeting his, his idol. He had this goofy smile on his face and, and behaving as if this was the, the, the most amazing privilege that he could have to spend a minute with Rav Aaron Salavechik, asking him how he was doing and, and, and conversing with him, and asking, asking him for advice, um, seeing Rav Lichtenstein together with, with Rav Aaron Salavechik as uh, a scene and a sight that I will never forget. Let me mention one more, uh, one more point, one more story that relates to this general theme. 
um, of the degree to which Rav Lichtenstein lived his life and viewed himself as a rather simple person. Um, I mentioned before that Rav Lichtenstein once uh, gave a sicha about learning Torah with your own children. So in that same sicha, he told another story. He said, Rav Lichtenstein, this is actually mentioned in, uh, in, some of the, in one of the Hespedim in the Leviah this morning. Excuse me. When Rav Lichtenstein's sons were in high school in the Tiv Meir, he used to go to uh, twice a week at night. He would go to Tiv Meir to learn with his sons, whichever ones were, were there. Well, I think it was Rav Meir who mentioned in the Hespid this morning that people say that he used to come during night Seder to learn with them. He said it wasn't during night Seder. He said it was after night Seder. He didn't interrupt their Seder. He would come afterwards and spend an hour and a half learning with his, uh, with his uh, sons in the, in the yeshiva. Not to mention that, uh, that uh, looks like he never slept on Shabbos afternoon. He slept Shabbos afternoon and he learned with all of his children. And not together, because they were all different. So one after the other, six children. One after the other, after the other. So he said that, so Lichtenstein said that somebody once came over to him at Nativ Meir in the base Medrash, I don't know if it was a teacher or another parent, and said to him, I don't understand, it's, I'm, I'm amazed that someone with your the life that you must have uh, is able to find the time, to make the time, to come, come here to learn with your, to learn with your, with your children. So, Rav Lichtenstein said, and I quote, "Histakalti alav ki ilu nafal He said, I don't understand. What do you mean? I'm a busy man. I have other things to do. How can you understand that I, I made time to come and learn with my, with my own children? It's, learning with my children is my primary responsibility. Of course I come to learn with my children. Who, who, who wouldn't come to learn with his children? I managed to find time to do everything else. And Rav Lichtenstein said this kind of thing. He wasn't saying it, you know, to make a point artificially, right? Rav Lichtenstein really meant it. That's how he viewed if the people, uh, uh, father is supposed to learn with his children. So that's what he does, just like any other good Jew would do. I want to now share with you one other brief uh, portion of that shear, that shear Yomi on the first of Iyar, Tavshin Nun Aleph, in Maseches Brachos. <coughs> the Gemara in Brachos talks about, um, well, actually, this Gemara is actually in Shabbos, but it relates to those subjects. The uh, what happens if some, someone's learning? There was a group of uh, people learning, the Gemara says, and it came time to say Kriyashma, or time to Davin. So do you interrupt your learning to say Kriyashma to, to Davin? So the Gemara says in Shabbos, Mafsikin Lilmod, you, uh, yeah, this is actually not an exact quote, but Mafsikin the Kriyashma, but not for Tefillah. Right? You interrupt the, the learning to say Kriyashma, but you don't interrupt the learning to Davin which presumably has something to do, I mean, there are various explanations. Presumably Rashi says something to do with Kriyashma being the Raisa, Tefillah being the Rabbanan. Obviously, you probably know that we, that's not, we don't paskin that way, but that's a statement in the, in the Gemara. There is a fascinating um, dissenting opinion quoted in the Yerushalmi. The Yerushalmi there in Masech Shabbos is in the first parak of Shabbos. Um, Yerushalmi quotes of Shimon Bar Yochai. I mean, everything I'm saying now is, is what Rav Lichtenstein taught us that day. Um, Rabbi Yochanan Amar B'Shem Rabbi Shimon Ben Yochai Kigon Anu Shasukin B'Talmud Torah People like us who are occupied with Talmud Torah Afilu L'Kriya Shema Inanu Mafsikin We don't stop learning even for Kriya Shema. Okay, so B'Shem Bar Yochai said if we're learning and it's time to say Kriya Shema, we don't stop, right? Not like the, uh, not like, uh, the, the five Rabbanim in the Haggadah, right? And he has my Kriya Shema Shal Shacharis, so they stopped and they said Kriya Shema. He said, no, if they, were, if they were learning, he says, well, keep learning, keep going through, pass on Kriya Shema, we'll miss Kriya Shema, we keep learning, that's what we do. So the Gemara is very puzzled by this, right? Normally, if you're learning Torah, you have to stop learning in order to do a mitzvah. 
right? The normal, the, the rule of ha'osek, the mitzvah, patrum and ha'mitzvah, generally speaking, doesn't apply to learning. Uh, the whole learning Torah is learning about doing mitzvahs, right? If you don't stop learning to do the mitzvahs, so what are you learning about them for, right? So that's the, 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 the general rule. So why does, why does uh, Rabbi Shimbar Yochai say that you don't interrupt the learning for Kriyashma? So the Gemara eventually says, Tamei de Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, the reason for Shimon ben Yochai is, ze shinun ze shinun, the ein mevatlin shinun mepnei shinun. So the reason you don't stop to say the Shema when you're learning is because Talmud Torah, learning, and Kriyashma are not that different from each other. They're both shinun, from the, from the language in the Pasuk, v'shinan tam levanecha. They're both uh, uh, speaking about important things, okay, we could, which we could translate the word in various different ways. Um, um, and since they are similar, that's why you don't interrupt the, uh, the learning to say Shema. Obviously, this has some relationship with what we were talking about earlier in terms of Shema having a Talmud Torah component, but that's not the angle that I'm focusing on here. Um, well, actually, yeah, okay, sorry. Rav Lichtenstein, Zechotar of Bivracha said, that some people interpret this, he actually quoted the Rav as saying, what does Rabbi Shimon Bar, Bar Yochai hold? Why, well, he, he holds, he said, that Kriya Shema actually really is just Talmud Torah. There's one opinion in the Rishonim, Talmud Rabbeinu Yonah Brachos, that holds that saying the Shema to fulfill the mitzvah of Shema is only the Rabbana. The real mitzvah, the Raisa, the original mitzvah of Kriya Shema is to say any parsha at all. Any Torah, that's the mitzvah of Shema. And the Rav Chazal said you should learn, you should say the dafka that parsha. Okay. And so the Rav said that's what Roshim Bar Yochai holds. And that's why he said, well, really, you can say any parsha to fulfill Shema. So if we're already learning anyway, we'll just keep learning what we're learning instead of, instead of, instead of switching to the, to the Shema. But Rav Luchensin said maybe that's wrong. He said, and Kedarko, um, a good example of the uh, one, one small element of Rav Luchensin's Derech Halimud. He was always looking for, for subtlety, always looking for, uh, even if we came up with a way to explain something, maybe there's a way to say it a little bit differently that can give us some sort of different insight. He said, well, maybe Rosh Hashanah Bar Yochai doesn't think that the mitzvah of Kriya Shema really is any Torah at all. It really is Shema. But maybe he holds that there's some aspect of Shema that's about Talmud Torah, kind of like we were saying before. And he kind of stopped there. He just said, you know, maybe there's this other way to look at it. And he didn't really elaborate. But I think that there's a couple of minutes more to say about this, um, which can give us another very important insight and an insight into Rav Lichtenstein. So let me, if, 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 let me pose the following question. And let me reset the stage here um, in case uh, some of what I just did was a little bit, uh, a little bit confusing. Rav Lichtenstein has just suggested the following. There's a mitzvah of Kriya Shema, mitzvah to say Shema. But there's one angle to that mitzvah that's a fulfillment of Talmud Torah also. Okay. And that's why, if Rabbi Shem Bar Yochai thinks that if people are learning Torah, they don't have to stop to say Shema, because Shema also has a Talmud Torah angle to it. Okay. But does that really make any sense? The, what he just said was that really the mitzvah of Shema is to say Shema. It happens to be that one angle, there might be an extra angle of Talmud Torah to it, but if you keep learning what you're learning and you don't stop to say Shema, then you're never going to say Shema, and then you won't do the mitzvah. You might have done something that has some similarity to one angle of the mitzvah, but you haven't done the mitzvah, the mitzvah is to say Shema. So what's going on here in this opinion of a Mishim Bar Yochai? So I think this is the wrong thing I didn't say that there's an awful lot to learn from another statement of Rishim Bar Yochai in that very same context, in the very same Gemara. Rishim Bar Yochai, in trying to explain in kind of broad terms, wh why was he so insistent in not stopping to learn? What's the, so say Shema, right? Why did he, why did he feel this way? So it says Rishim Bar Yochai, the Gemara says, He 
order the difference, the Gemara quotes different statement of Shimba Yochai. Ila Havina Kaim al Tur the Sinai Beshaita this Yahavis or Isa the Israel. Shimba Yochai said, Had I been standing on Har Sinai at the time when the Jewish people were given the Torah, Havina Mitba Kumi Rahmana, I would have demanded from the Ribbon Shalom, the Ispiri Lahadain Barnasha, train Pumin, that he create for the human being, for every human being, two mouths. Chad di Haviloi Ba Raisa, Vichad di Isavid Ba Kol Torche. One mouth to learn Torah with, and the other mouth to do everything else. Shimon Bar Yochai was so committed in this, many of you probably are familiar with from the other famous stories about Shimon Bar Yochai, so the, with the cave and so forth, was so devoted to immersing himself in Torah that he, 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 he wanted his whole life to be Kulo Torah. And he would have demanded, he said, for the Bona Shalom to give him another mouth so that he could, whatever else he had to do, he could keep learning Torah at the same time. That was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's attitude. That was his attitude. And that's why he was so upset about the idea of having to stop learning Torah, even to say Shema. Now the Gemara continues to say that Rabbi Shimon Yochai changed his mind. The Chazar Umar, he, he, he changed his mind and said, Ma in chadhu les alma yochal koimbe min dilturia delay, ilu haven tre al achas kama vachama. He says, you know, the truth is as it is. Even with just one mouth, it's almost impossible for the world to continue to exist with all the terrible things people do with their one mouth. If people had two, could imagine all the Lashon Hara that would get spoken, right? I mean, he might learn Torah while he was doing everything else. Other people would stay Lashon Hara at the same time they were doing everything else. So he said, maybe it's a good idea if people only have one mouth. Allow me to actually digress for one moment here before we come back to the Kriya Shema discussion, just to make a comment about what we were just, uh, just talking about, Lashon Hara and so forth. Rav Lichtenstein's sensitivity to every human being, including his Talmidim, was famous. It connects to some degree with what we were talking about before, his sort of sense of simplicity as a human being. He really didn't think of himself as necessarily so different from all the other people in the yeshiva, all the Talmidim. The idea of Rav Lichtenstein saying Lashon Hara about somebody is rather, uh, rather absurd. Um, I, I want to recount a, a story that actually just the other day so in the wake of his passing uh, there's obviously a lot of uh, stories being uh, written uh, about on the, uh, on the internet and I saw one story that, uh, that actually reminded me of something that I was actually present for uh, this happened to a Talmud by the name of Aviad Friedman who, uh, who I remember from the yeshiva and who, who later uh, went on to some uh, rather prominent uh, positions in Israel, both corporate and, and, and government positions. Um, but he, he reminded me of this, uh, this episode. Rav Lichtenstein was giving a, a sicha in the base medrash. Every once in a while, Rav Lichtenstein would, uh, if he had some message he wanted to deliver the Talmidim or he was upset about something that he wanted to give some musr about, so the, the morning Seder in Gush ran from 8.30 in the morning to 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and that's when lunch was at 1 o'clock. So every once in a while, there would uh, suddenly a little, tiny little piece of uh, the, the scrap paper would be uh, put up on the wall, with a little note from Avluchenstein that said, uh, usually it said, Sicha b'shtemesle v'arba'im. It was the Sicha uh, at 12.40. Okay, when the morning Seder ended at 1 o'clock. These were known throughout the, uh, among the Talmudim of the Yeshiva throughout for generations as actually the, the, I think the expression was used, in fact, in one of the Hasbedim this morning. Among the Americans, it was known as the 20 to 20 Sicha. And the Israelis, the Esrim le Esrim, um, which meant that it started at 20 to, to, to 1 and it ended at 20 after 1. Um, Nebuchadnezzar was not known for finishing uh, in time for lunch. Um, but in any case, so one of these, uh, Reluchstein was upset. He, he apparently had gotten wind that some Talmidim had been complaining about some, I don't know, the disrepair of the classrooms or some renovations that were going on. And he, I guess he felt that Talmidim were uh, un, uh, immaturely whining about uh, problems that they, shouldn't be, that they shouldn't be complaining about. And so he uh, gave a sikha, giving muster to the Talmidim to not, uh, complain, not, to not complain about such things. 
And so Aviad recounts the story that, that during the course of the Sicha, um, he was apparently not so enamored with some of the things Rav Luchstein was saying, and he uh, kind of smirked um, during, the, uh, during the Sicha. And uh, Rav Luchstein saw it, and paused in the middle of the Sicha, and said, Aviyad atatzochik avatal yodea shani tzodik. And then he moved on with his, with his remarks okay, in front of the whole yeshiva. Okay. And then he moved on. At, at 11 o'clock that night, Aviyad was in the base medrash. And so, you know, this was before the days of cell phones. Okay, so there were, there were uh, pay phones downstairs, a few pay phones. It was always a big competition who got to use the, uh, the pay phone. But the pay people, all, there were also incoming calls on the, the pay phone. People would call and whoever was passing by would pick up the phone. It's another famous, uh, famous story about Rav Lichtenstein that he would, he would always answer the phones when he was uh, passing by if it was ringing. Um, in any case, so it was 11 o'clock at night and Rav Yad was in the base medrash and somebody came up to him and says, uh, you have to go downstairs. You have an urgent phone call from Aaron. So he wasn't expecting any phone calls. He didn't know who this Aaron was. And uh, so he went downstairs, picked up the phone, and of course, who's the Aaron? The Aaron is Rav Lichtenstein. So first of all, let's pause for a moment, right? Rav Lichtenstein called up his yeshiva, somebody answered the phone, and he said, this is Aaron. <laughs> right? Uh, it's just, uh, I, was, I remember once I was, uh, I was at a, a minion in Katamon, in the, where Rav Lichtenstein lived at the time, and I think it was a Shabbos Mincha minion or something, and obviously he was generally a known figure in the neighborhood, um, but uh, for whatever reason, this particular minion, the Gabbai didn't know who he was, and, and the Gabbai was looking for somebody to call up for a shlishi at, uh, you know, at this minion, and he happened to randomly pick Rav Lichtenstein, to, to, so he asked him, what's your name? So he said, Aaron ben Yechiel. That was uh, Rav Lichtenstein. Uh, no, uh, no harav than, uh, than either. In any case, so Aviyad comes to the phone, he picks up the phone, it's Rav Lichtenstein. What's Rav Lichtenstein have to say? He tells, he tells uh, Aviyad, he said, I, I can't sleep. He said, tomorrow I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up in front of the whole base medrash and apologize and ask Mechila for embarrassing you in front of the yeshiva. But even though I'm planning to do that in public tomorrow, I just couldn't fall asleep without first uh, asking you for your mechila tonight. Um, and so he asked for his, uh, for his mechila. Aviad was, was mochel him and pleaded with him in no uncertain terms to please not get up in front of the yeshiva the next day and embarrass him further by apologizing to him. Um, so there's an, <laughs> the, uh, the Rav Luchenstein who uh, his sensitivity to every person, even to a even to a Talmud, and even to a Talmud who had disrespected him, um, really knew no bounds. One of the most vivid memories that I have of Lichtenstein speaking in the yeshiva is from another uh, episode. There was. Um, There was a, a Shana Aleph Talmud, Israeli Talmud in the yeshiva, who was uh, saying Kaddish. He had lost a parent. And so he davened for the Amid every morning for Shachars. And apparently there were some older Talmidim, Shana He, Shana Vav Talmidim, um, who were very uh, unhappy with how long davening was taking in the morning. They thought it was too slow. So a bunch of them went over to this guy and they complained to him that he was davening too slow. And uh, and the kid was, you know, rather intimidated. These, you know, these, you know, uh, people were. He was probably 18, and they were probably 23, and and uh, these much bigger than he was, and veteran Talmidim, and uh, he was very uh, upset. And he he got so upset that he just stopped davening in the yeshiva. Every morning he got up and he he walked uh, like uh, 10, 15 minutes to a nearby yeshuv, and daven shachris there. Rav Lichtenstein got wind of this. He gave a 20 to 20 sicha. We talked about before, and among other uh, points that he made, so your looking scene didn't usually get angry, but if it was about the uh, the uh, suffering of another person, he could get angry. And I'll never forget, at some point during the course of his remarks, 
he started talking about the lav, the avera of Onas Yasomim. Have this 18 year old boy, a Yasom, saying Kaddish for his, his father, I think it was. And Luchastin starts to read from the Rambam in Ochos Deos, Perak Vav, about the mitzvah, the Iser of Onas Yasomim. Chayev Adam Lihizoher be Yasomim Valmanos, the person has to be very careful with orphans and widows. Because they're, uh, they're very low of spirit. And even if they're wealthy, even if it's the king's widow and his Yisomim and his orphans, um, we are uh, commanded. Do not cause any distress to a widow or the orphan. And how should you behave with the orphan and the widow. Lo yidad beri aleihem el arakos, you should only speak softly to them. Velo yinog ben elamin a kavod, and you should only treat them with respect. Velo yachiv gufa mebaavoda, velibam bedvarim kashim, and you shouldn't cause their bodies pain with work, or their hearts pain with difficult matters. V'yachos al mamonam, yoshi mamonatzmo, and you should care about their money more than yours. And then he came to the next line, and a member of Lichtenstein read in the face, and anyone who mistreats a Yasum or Almana over below Sase, the Lavze, and this Avera, Afal Pishain Lokin Alav, even though it's not accompanied by Malkus, Hari Onsho Mefurish Batora, the Chora Api, the Haragti Eschem Becharev. Punishment is explicit in the Torah. I will be furious with you and slaughter you with a sword. There's reading a Rambam and there's reading a Rambam. And the righteous anger that Rav Lichtenstein felt for the elbow for the suffering of this Yasom in the yeshiva brought, for me, one of the greatest Musr Shmuzes that I ever experienced. Let's return to the, back to the Rishalmi, to its main point. Rishalmi had said, that the um, Rav Shumba Yochai said, I wish that God, Kaddish Baruch had given us two mouths, right? One to learn Torah with all the time, and the other to do everything else. But uh, he didn't, and he was probably right because there'd be too much Lashon Hara otherwise. It seems what's going on with Rosh Hashim Bar Yochai's position. Remember, what was the halacha we're trying to explain? Rosh Hashim Bar Yochai said, if you're learning Torah, you don't stop to say Kriya Shema. And we raised the question, well, even if it's true that there's some Talmud Torah in Kriya Shema, you're still not saying Shema, and that's the real mitzvah. How could you do that? How could you skip the Shema? So it seems to me that what's going on in the mind of Rosh Hashim Bar Yochai is that Rosh Hashim Bar Yochai was saying, I understand that. I know that if I don't say Shema, I'm not fulfilling the Shema. But what am I supposed to do? I also want to spend my whole life learning Torah. I wish I had another mouth. I want to learn Torah all the time. And here I'm stuck. What am I supposed to do? I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt my, my Talmud Torah. So it seems what Rishim Bar Yochai was saying was, OK, so if I have to shake a lulav, so I have no choice. I have to, uh, I have to stop learning to pick up my lulav and esrog. But Shema, the Shema is so close to Talmud Torah. Even the Shema itself is sort of a little bit of Talmud Torah. Do I really have to stop this to do that instead? He couldn't bear the idea of, of, of interrupting his learning, and he was kind of in this, in this battle of, of wills between the Talmud Torah mitzvah and the, and the Shema mitzvah. He wasn't saying that you shouldn't say Shema, he was just saying that this, uh, these two things that I want to do are in such tension with each other. This, this, is a theme that Rav Lichtenstein taught us over and over and over and over again. One of the most fundamental statements in the Torah of its demands of us is the Pasuk in Sefer Dvarim. Um, he nesatu lifneichem hayom esachayim v'yasamav v'asatov v'yasarav v'acharta b'chayim. You should choose life, you should choose the good over the bad. And Rav Lichtenstein would always say, choosing the good over the bad, that's, that's the easy part. That's the easy challenge in life. 
The real challenges, the real difficult spots in life are when the two choices that face you aren't one that's good and one that's bad. They're when the two choices that face you are ones that are both good in different respects or both bad. And you have to struggle and decide which one to choose. Which is the lesser evil? Which is the greater good? Which is the one that's necessary to do even though the other one might also have its advantages? Most of us, when we come to a, a Rebbe to ask a question, usually it's that kind of question. If one was good and one was bad, straightforwardly, we usually wouldn't need to ask the question. But we need advice, we need guidance, hashkafic guidance, about the next steps in our lives, whatever they may be. It's usually a lot more complicated than that. Rav Lichtenstein said many times, once, uh, he, said, he said he was asked if he could encapsulate what he gained from his time in doing his doctorate in Harvard in English literature. If he can encapsulate it briefly. So he, he, he always said, I learned that the world and people are complex. I remember once in a, a late night rap session in the base medrash in Gush with an older Talmud. Some of you probably know him. He's now Rabbi uh, Ruvain Ziegler. Um, I remember schmoozing with him and he was saying, you know, sometimes you talk to people about some issue of the day in the Jewish community, whatever it is, and, and sometimes the, you know, the response is, oh, it's Pashat. Right? Of course, this is the answer. And he said, it's not Pashat. That's what we learned from Rav Lichtenstein. Whatever the issue may be, if it's a difficult issue, it means that it's difficult. It means that it's complicated. It means that it's complex. And that the human beings who are affected by it are complex human beings. And that we need, in a world in which all these ideals that we, like, we learn about in the abstract when we're learning Torah and learning Hashkafa, when it comes to the, to the real world, those ideals are often in competition with each other. And when in trying to decide what to do in the face of those competing ideals in the real world, between the Talmud Torah and the Shema, that's when we wish we had Trey Pumin, we wish we had two mouths, we wish we could do both. But Rav Lichtenstein, always the, the realist, always recognized that that's not the world we live in. The Kaddish, Bar Kaddish Baruch Hu didn't create us with two mouths. He only gave us one. And so we can only do one thing. And so we have to make a decision. And we have to struggle sometimes with those decisions. <laughs> We've seen once also what Ashel Shura Sikha spoke about the, um, spoke about a, uh, something he heard from one of the other Rashi Yeshivotas there. We all knew who it was, but he didn't say who it was. Um, who, uh, who, had, who had said that he, when he has Talmidim in the yeshiva and Shanahei, Shanavav, who are leaving the yeshiva, and they tell him they're leaving, so he would always say to them, you know, it's okay, you have to leave, you have to leave, you need a job, you have to go, but you should always remember that, that really you should be here. That learning Torah is your life, and uh, you might have to do something else, but really you should be here. And the Luchensin said, I think, Adarabah. That's exactly the opposite. I say to, the, to you, Talmidim, who are sitting in the yeshiva now, you should never ever for a moment sit and learn in yeshiva with the idea in your head that the only good thing to do in the entire world is to sit and learn in yeshiva. There are an incredible number of important things to do out there in the world, credible needs that people have, tremendous chasadim, and many, many mitzvot that need to be done out there in, in, the, in the world. You just have to know that this time in your life is the time when you sh that you should be devoting to Kulo Torah, and one day, um, one day you will move on to, uh, to everything else. The world is not black and white. There are different and sometimes competing goods in, uh, goods in the world. And you have to learn and absorb as much Torah and, and, uh, and, and Chinuch and Shimush as possible so that when the time comes for you to face that world, you'll be able to make those decisions in a better way. This way of viewing problems, something that has allowed Rav, Lich, allowed Rav Lichtenstein and I think to a great degree his Talmidim to be able to be rather successful, at least more than many other people I think, in being able to make a decision and choose a side in a way in, 
in, at the same time is not necessarily disparaging every single argument that can be made for the other side that, that you didn't choose. We can have a disagreement. Rav Lichtenstein, whenever he would, even if he came to very firm conclusions, always spent a lot of time explaining why the other side might be right. Something that also can lead to more shalom. Once at a session where people were asking Rav Lichtenstein questions, somebody asked him the question that so many people ask. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of you are facing this kind of question at this time in your life. Um, the question of choosing a career. And the person asked a very specific question. He said, if a person thinks that he has the kishronos, that he has the talents and the ability to be, that he thinks, to be successful in Avodos HaKodesh, so is the person obligated to, to go into that, that as a career? And Rav Lichtenstein, whenever he was asked this kind of question, as I just said, always weighed the positives on both sides, right? The similar kind of question people, uh, many people ask, uh, should I be a mechanic in America or a plumber in Israel, right? Or usually more an accountant than a plumber in Israel. Plumbers make more money. Um, but, so Rav Lichtenstein would always, that's a good example of these questions where there are obviously competing goods on both sides. And Rav Lichtenstein would always very carefully work through the, the possibilities. But in this case, or of Lichtenstein, the question of if I can be an Avodos HaKodesh, I think I'll succeed, do I have to? So he talked about different aspects of the issue and then he came to the end and he said, you know, uh, he, he said, you, obviously Avodos HaKodesh is not the only, only good thing to do in the world. He said somebody becomes a physician, every single minute they spend in their whole career is a mitzvah, right? So he says, he said, but, he concluded with the following. He said, does everybody have to be a fireman? It's very important, it's absolutely necessary, right? How could we not tell everybody to be a fireman? Pikuach nefesh, right? So obviously not everybody has to be a fireman. But Rav Lichtenstein said, he said, if there's a fire, you need to be a fireman. If there's a fire burning right now, so that everybody has to be a fireman. So he said, not as emphatically as I'm making it sound right now, but he said, look around the world, look at the, at the needs of the Jewish community. Is there a glut of high quality people filling every position and chinuch and community leadership in all sorts of ways in the Jewish world? And so he said, sometimes there's a fire, and if you can, you need to be a fireman. Okay, um, I'm uh, just about out of time, um, uh, so I'm going to skip one, uh, one piece here and, and, and get to the end here. Just to just briefly mention, I had, well, I'll leave it alone. Okay. I just I, I want to just make one point. It's going to be a little bit dis, disjointed because I, I can't develop it the way I wanted to. But just to mention one other aspect of Rav Lichtenstein before I get to my final final point. Rav Lichtenstein demanded was a very demanding person. And I spoke before about how how sensitive he was and how nice he was, and that's all very true. But Rav Lichtenstein had incredibly high standards, and he didn't brook people who were. Um, who, were, who, who were slackers, or who didn't put in every bit of effort. Um, he, had, he was very demanding. He demanded total commitment. He demanded rigor. He demanded uh, both with regard to time and attention. And he did so of others and of himself. Um, and to him, this was just obvious. Well, that's Omachus Shamayim. That's, that's what you do. What else are we here for if not to, if not to use every moment that we can to to do something. He was, he, I'll, I'll mention just one sentence, what I, what I had wanted to talk about. Uh, you know, Lichtenstein is famous for his use of, of uh, English literature in his, um, in his hashkafa and in his, in his uh, speaking. The only time I'm aware that I can remember, that, that I'm aware of, that Lichtenstein ever actually even an entire sicha, which was basically a, uh, uh, you know, not about Torah, but about literature. Um, I, didn't have, I didn't hear this myself, but it was uh, about nine years ago on Tu Bishvat. He gave a sicha 
the subject of which was Robert Frost's famous poem, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, which I'm sure many of you know. Close reading, analysis of the poem and its implications. And the, uh, one of the main points that, the, that they came to at the end was this idea that the, I'm not going to be able to explain this to those of you not familiar with the poem, but the, 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 the person who was drawn to the, the beauty and the aesthetics of the, the woods and the snow that was falling and the quiet. Um, and at the end, in the very famous last uh, stanza, um, the woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. And a Luchensin saw at the end of that poem the, the challenge of the, the, uh, the, the competition between the desire to uh, to observe the beauty and to appreciate it and to, to, to appreciate the aesthetics and to just sit there, quiet, have, a, have a quiet moment alone and watch. And at the other hand, the pulling of moral obligation. Right? I wish I could, but I can't because I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. And obviously the sleep there, a reference to death. There's so much to do. So much to do. And in that context, Natsichai quoted the Mishnah Pekayavos, Hayom Katsar Vamalach Amaruba. That, that sense that there isn't time to stop, that life puts on us a lot of demands to accomplish what needs to be accomplished was a central aspect of Rav Lichtenstein's character. I have to, even if this might take an extra one minute, I, can't, uh, I have to mention, as it's now uh, getting dark outside, we're entering the period of Yom Azikaron. Um, another story that I uh, read recently about Rav Lichtenstein um, one of the uh, Talmidim who, d during the war in Lebanon in 2006, um, was fighting in, in Lebanon with a, in a unit together, actually with Shai, one of Lichtenstein's sons, and they were they were they were there for several weeks in a row, and then he had a he had a, a day off, and he said he, he had a, a day off. He came back down from from Lebanon. He first he went to he had to go to a, a levaya of a first cousin of his who had fallen in the, in the war. And then he came to, to Yerushal, uh, actually, uh, he came to see to Rav Luchenstein, to see Rav Luchenstein. He said he walked into the apartment, and Rav Luchenstein, he said, was sitting. He looked, he looked worn and haggard, and with with worry, uh, overcome with worry for his for his Talmidim who were out in the on the on the battlefield. Um, and he had been. He, he said to him that I. Rav Luchenstein said to him, I, I I feel like I have to I have to. Do something extra in my Talmud Torah, in my in my uh, in, in my Avodas Hashem, uh, to to help this uh, this uh, this war effort. If my Talmudim were out there on the battlefield fighting, then I have to be fighting harder here too. And that was Rav Luchensin said to him when he was sitting in his in his apartment, um, and and he the exhaustion that was on his on his face, the idea that Rav Luchensin could somehow do even more than he usually did. Is uh, must have been something to behold, and before he left, he insisted he he sat down and he wrote two letters out by hand, one to his son and one for all the other talmidim in the yeshiva from the yeshiva who were out in the in the, on the battlefields, and he made him go somewhere to to even though it was late at night to to photocopy the letter, and uh, and when he went when he went back after his day off. Um, he or Luchenstein asked him to, to give a copy of the letter to every one of the Talmudim in the yeshiva that he would um, that he would encounter during the course of that time. Um, so it's worth remembering that we haven't focused on it that Rav Luchenstein, besides everything else about him, was also a Rosh Hashivat has there, um, who's and uh, in fact one of the great uh, one of the great philosophers of the of the Hesder movement, um, and whose appreciation for and devotion to the Chayel Tzahal. Um, was also something to behold, and who, of course, suffered greatly from the loss of, of many Talmidim um, in uh, Israel's various wars. The Lichtenstein's insistence on moving on to the promises that need keeping and leaving the quiet moment behind leads us to the final characteristic of his that I, I want to emphasize. Several uh, years ago, remember how long it is now, uh, Talmidim of Lichtenstein started publishing a series of svarim of uh, notes from his shiurim. This is Tavshin Nunches, it's longer ago than I thought, almost 20 years ago. The first volume that came out, Shiri Her of Varun Lichtenstein, was on, uh, on Taros. And in the Hakdama, the, it, wasn't, it was, like I said, notes, notes from Talmidim, but uh, he wrote a little, uh, a little introduction. 
And there's a line in here that when I first got the Sefer and I read it, just, just exploded out at me, and, 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 and I have to share it with you. We all know, probably by heart, the lines from the davening we say every morning in Birchus Kriyashma, V'sein b'libeinu l'havinu l'haskil l'shmor l'almodu l'lamei d'shmor v'lasos l'kayin es kol d'irei toras t'chad b'yavah. The Lichtenstein, in his acknowledgments, thanking different people at the end of his, uh, as many people do, offers hamakar satov to, to the Rebbeinu Shalom in his last paragraph. It says, Barosh Rishona v'rama shona l'chalutin shevach v'hoda'a l'borei olam Shasam Chalki ben Yoshvei Beit HaMidrash V'shazikani Lish'of Lahavin U'lahaskil Lish'mo Al-Modu L'lamei Dish'mo V'lasos V'kayim Nekol Divei Tamud Taratov Yahada Lichtstein added a word to that list Right? He didn't say a tefillah to Hashem that he put in our hearts to to understand and to hear and to learn and to teach and to do and to keep the mitzvahs with love He added a word at the beginning Lish'of Shofus means to strive, to yearn. And you'll notice, if you pay attention to the grammar here, that it's not just another thing on the list. He wasn't saying, in addition to Sein Belibenu, all those other things, also give me the, the yearning. No, no, no. It says, he says, he, he, it's not a tefil actually here, he says, Shizikani, he says, thanks, Takarish Baruch Hu, for giving him the privilege, Lishof, to yearn, to strive. Lahavin, Ulaskil, Lishmol, Modul, Lamed, and so forth. He says, God, thank you, Hashem, for giving me the privilege to want to learn the Torah, to understand it, and to keep the mitzvahs be'ahava. Luchin could, could, could never put pen to paper and say that a Kodesh Baruch who gave me the zechus to understand the Torah. He was too much of an anav to write that. Many people at a young age. Are, uh, have a, a great sense of mission, are devoted to, uh, to their own religious growth, always trying to become a better person, trying to become a better, uh, better at Talmud Torah, trying to become uh, different tomorrow than I am today. And just about every person reaches a point in adulthood where they come to a plateau, and I, I, I am who I am, and uh, maybe on uh, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, I try to fix uh, one thing here or there. But the a notion that, that, that somehow I, I'm still a changing person is, is something that most people in their adulthood uh, are not in that place. Rav Lichtenstein, to the day that he was Nifter, Rav Lichtenstein was in many ways, in this respect, almost like the Mechilas photo, like a teenager. Rav Lichtenstein, was always, always shoef. He never, ever for a moment thought of himself as a finished product. He never thought, viewed himself as, as doing what he does. Every day I give um, a Rosh Hashiva, I give shiurim, I, this, I give speeches, I write articles, this is what I do, and that's who I am. Not at all. Rav Lichtenstein, as I mentioned before, was always running everywhere. He always was grabbing every minute. And, the, and you could tell that he was grabbing every minute because he always had this thirst this thirst, not just to learn more if that was possible, but a thirst to, to somehow find some way to improve, to find some way to, uh, to, to keep becoming a greater and greater and greater person. It was really something to behold. I'll leave you with one final story in this regard. The way the Hesder uh, system was built originally was that there was a five-year program and Talmidim were in yeshiva for about a year at the beginning, and then they went to the army for about nine months, and then they came back to the yeshiva for another year, year and a half, and then they went back to the army for six months, and then they came back to the yeshiva for another year and a half or so. There was a time, um, back when I was in yeshiva, this goes back about 20 years, um, when the, the army wasn't happy with the system, and they were pushing very hard to switch it, they, want, they didn't want the shirut, the service in the army, to be split up into two parts. They thought it was better for the, better for the army, for the guys to be in the army straight for the whole 15 months that the Hezdernikim had to be in the, in the army. It's a very big machlokas, um, and the Rashi yeshiva were, were fighting against it. Eventually the army won, that the system now, I believe, is, is, is like that. Um, Rav Lichtenstein gave a sichat shal shudas in which he recounted a meeting that the Rashi yeshivot has there had with some of the high army brass about this, about this issue. 
And at some and what the army was proposing was that they go to yeshiva for two years at the beginning and then have 15 months in the army and then go back to the yeshiva for the rest of the time. So they were adding more yeshiva at the beginning in exchange for doing it together. And at one point he said one of the, I don't know if it was a general or a colonel, some high ranking officer who was there, got very angry. And he said to the Rosh Yeshiva, I don't know if it was to himself or to all of them, he said, he said, Imatem choshvim shachresh natayim limud ba yeshiva shalachem. Habanim lo yecholim lishod ba tzava shana vachetzi. Az yesh ez abaya ba yeshiva shalachem. If you think that after two whole years in your yeshiva, your students can't survive uh, yeah, religiously a year and a half in the, uh, in the army, there must be something wrong with your, with your yeshiva. So Rav Lichtenstein said, and this is another moment that's, that's the charut aluach libi, Rav Lichtenstein said, and I said, I said to him, Zeh ha'avdel b'ni uveinecha, ata rotze she yisredu, va'ani rotze she yigdelu. That's the difference between you and me. You want them to survive, I want them to grow. That was Rav Lichtenstein's mission for his Talmidim, and it remained till his very last breath, his mission for himself. I've managed to talk here for over an hour, and you'll notice I never even mentioned Rav Lichtenstein's godless in Torah, his greatness as a philosopher, as a thinker, as a community leader, as an institution builder, and manager, as a posek, as a religious visionary, as the builder of entire communities throughout the world, and even for that matter, most of all, as a master teacher. All of those, uh, the, the, uh, the bread and butter of who Rav Lichtenstein was, Rav Lichtenstein, unsurprisingly, um, is someone who cannot, uh, with any, uh, to any degree, be encapsulated in one hour. Um, but I hope that in the course of this hour, um, those of you who uh, didn't have the zechus of sitting b'tzilo uh, for any length of time um, are able to appreciate something uh, important about his greatness and his character. He's a chobarot.